that uh, I came here. Uh-huh. So it's been long. Uh, practicing exclusively only prosthodontics, sir. I gave my specialist exam and then uh, okay. I'm doing only prosth, so no, no GP practice. Oh, that's nice. Prosthodontics, are you doing implants there? By any chance? Implants? Uh, yes, sir. We have two implantologists. They do the implant. I don't place the implants. I just do the prosthetic part of the implant. Superstructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Nice. Welcome, uh, Dr. Davis uh, Thomas, sir. Yeah. Hello. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Sonia, how are you? I don't know I'm who fine, said sir. welcome, but whoever it is, thank you. Sorry, Kishor, from Enapaya, sir. What is your name again? I'm sorry. I'm I'm Hari Kishor from Enapaya. I was yes, communicating we, with you. We have been communicating. How are you yes, doing, Hari? You're doing good. I'm, I'm good, sir. How How about you? Good so far. Are you in your practice? I see you in the background. Is it? Practice or you are no. home? This is our e-learning uh, center in Nanopa University. Okay. And uh, we, whenever we conduct some webinars, we usually use this place so that we have good connectivity. And so, this is a prescribed place for us. The only reason I asked, I saw someone behind you, and I was just like, "Is it a pra- hello?" I'm is, Dr. is he also Dr. faculty? Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Umma from Nanopa Dental College. Hi, well, how are you doing? I'm good, sir. How are you? Uh, good. Uh, I have a connection with Yanapoy. That was my first um, employer ever in uh, India. Um, oh, back Dr. in Dave. nine. Who is that? So you have Dr. Akhtar. Oh, you have Dr. Dr. Akhtar Akhtar Hussain and Dr. Sripati Rao. Yes. Uh, yes. Online. Long time no see, Dr. Akhtar. How are I you? I'm good. I'm good. How long did you I work don't with us? Even... Uh, just a few months because 93 when I um, sorry uh, I came to the US 93 so 92 when Dr. Oh, Terley was the I think correct, he was the, the T-H-E-L-L-Y yeah, yeah he was the yeah. principal then yes, and then yes. that was my tutorship then and I remember coming to your practice and stuff at that time yeah. with a couple of my um, my colleagues um, so we, we came there to your practice too in Mangalore mm-hmm. Okay, how long have you been so, in the U.S. now? 27 years. Now, this is 28th oh, wow. year. That's pretty long, yeah. yes. Most of my adulthood has been here. I was a young yeah. dentist when I came, so... Yes, so mm-hmm. I know Yanapoy. Is Dr. Terley still there or...? Is... Yeah, he's not with us, but he's there, yeah. He's, he's there, He's, okay. uh, yeah, a little uh, old now, but he's okay. Yeah. Retired? Okay. Yeah, All right. long back. Um, any other faces? I don't know if I would recognize anybody. I'm mean, I'm not seeing the whole screen, so bear with me if I don't see um, many of uh, you. We, doctor, sir, we have uh, Dr. Shripati Rao, sir, also online. Dr. Shripati Rao, the oral surgeon? Yes. 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 Oh, my Lord, he is my teacher from Manipal. Wow. I don't Did see we... him. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, my yeah. Lord. Do- yeah. Sir, how are you? Good I'm morning. Fine. Good evening to you. Good evening. I'm very happy to see you now. My God, same is the um, feeling here. I'm the like, year I of evolution, it. 1990. Are you in Manipur now? The scenic no, coastal okay? town, Mangala, uh, was Mandela. witness to a no, new I'm era in the field of medical education. Wow. The Islamic Academy of Education, a non-profit trust committed you. to the oh, upliftment so, of I, minorities, I was established no by the entrepreneur, Mr. Yanapoya Abdullah Kunhi. Perceiving the potential of Mangalore suburbs to be a prospective educational hub, he began the establishment of colleges with the principle of excellence in professional education, which flourished into a full-fledged university, providing training in medicine and all its parallel fields. Currently, Yenapoya is a dynasty of educational institutes like Yenapoya Dental College, Medical College, Nursing College, Physiotherapy College, Yenapoya Pharmacy College and Research Center, and Yenapoya Institute of Arts, Science, Commerce and Management were further established to offer education and research in the areas of pharmacy, management and general education. Yenapoya offers a plethora of courses with 89 ongoing and 20 approved and proposed programs. 
The PhD program has been introduced in 39 departments and research center as per the UGC regulations. The medical college also offers undergraduate courses in technical programs like medical lab technology, medical imaging technology, perfusion, renal dialysis, anesthesia and OT, cardiovascular technology, respiratory care, optometry, as well as hospital administration and others to name a few. Students are presented with ample opportunities to find their niche. Spread over a sprawling 36.76 acre campus at Teralakate, Mangaluru, all the constituent colleges are provided with excellent infrastructure to impart knowledge. Spacious examination halls and 19 lecture halls have the electronic support system to engage students eloquently. Practical training is complemented with well-equipped laboratories. The anatomy dissection hall introduces students to the intricacies of the human body before undertaking clinical examinations and procedures. Well-equipped pathology and biochemistry lab foster the importance of diagnostic procedures to implement treatment. The central laboratory is a key unit, conducts number of diagnostic and confirmatory tests. Many significant so in vivo researchers are conducted other, at the Animal um, House of Pharmacology Lab. Do at the Nursing Sorry, Nutrition yeah. Lab, aspiring Anything students else. learn to put together a nutritious meal joint, for the benefit I'm of their wards. Pre-clinical exercise at the Physiotherapy uh, Lab enhances so clinical there, understanding. So Dental there, okay. simulators prepare hi. students to handle <laughs> clinical very scenarios. Good evening to you, sir. The simulation center at Yanapoya is the largest in India and trains students in a virtual environment to mitigate errors and maintain safety. This includes a number of unique state-of-the-art facilities like anatomic table simulating the human body. A number of high-fidelity simulators like infant, adolescent, Adult yeah, and maternal fetal simulators yeah. are housed here. Students seeking yeah, to further their knowledge Good can man, do so with CPR manicures, endoscopy, how, laparoscopy how is, uh, trainers, cath lab, and off. ultrasound the trainers. The, now, right? the simulation center is a milestone aimed at perfecting the skills of trainees and delivering Where excellent are you, treatment. Uh, are you in Bangalore? No, Comprising of uh, well-stocked no, 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 central library, housing thousands of books, journals yeah. and Is publications, regularly updated like via digital media, corner. with no, seven no, museums no, documenting no, no, various no, no, areas no, of no, health no, sciences. No, the Dental no, Museum no, being the most okay. advanced, no, affirms no, Yenapoya is not good? just a university for the students, no, but a you. knowledge center. Yeah, Students at Yenapoya okay. acquire uh, valuable experience uh, during hands-on okay, training at the yeah, medical yeah. college and hospital yeah, with yeah. above 2,000 outpatients per day at that's OPD, a fully functional uh, ICU, general uh, wards, uh, blood bank. have been established. The operation theater is equipped with 14 state-of-the-art modular rotis with stainless steel makeup and HEPA filters and antibacterial and antifungal walls. The operating rooms have state-of-the-art equipment adequately staffed with experienced professionals. They are customized for smooth delivering of operating procedures for super speciality and other routine emergency surgical services. The theaters meet quality standards and visaged under NADH norms. The state-of-the-art robotic Hello. surgery unit at Da Vinci Surgical you? Systems Good. is a first doing? in coastal Karnataka. Patients from all straight of society are benefiting from this advanced and minimally invasive surgical system at a highly subsidized cost. Considering the demand for surgeons skilled in robotic assisted surgeries, the university, in collaboration with Intuitive Surgical USA Inc., a global technology leader in minimally invasive robotic assisted surgeries, has established an advanced surgical skills and robotic surgery training center, which is a second of its kind in the country. The dental CAD center is one of a kind in the city. The radiology department is one of our primary diagnostics 
Diagnostic Center, equipped with ultra modern units for diagnosis. The facilities are echocardiography, X ray, CT scan, ultrasound, and digital radiography. The 3 Tesla MRI has been installed for making use of highly advanced and reliable imaging technology for early diagnosis and treatment. There are only a handful of teaching hospitals in the country with this facility. Hemapoya Research Center is a unique venture equipped with state-of-the-art mass spectrometric instruments and dedicated team aimed at groundbreaking research in newer fields of study including biostatistics and information, molecular biology, toxicology, cell culture, stem cells and regenerative medicine, nanosciences and nanomedicine, microbiology and mycology, infectious disease and bioanalytics, also patenting the findings. The YU IOB Center for Systematic Biology and Molecular Medicine promotes further research in the branch of molecular biology. Center for Biomaterials and Medical Devices focuses on developing medical devices, biomaterials and non-invasive methods for diagnosis and treatment of diseases. The Center for Health Professional Education conducts regular feedback sessions and training workshops to all faculty. The Center for Substance Abuse and Prevention is an active entity that performs extensive research and counseling on tobacco, alcohol and drug cessation. It's 10 o'clock here. Center for stopped. Ethics is proactive in imparting bioethics and medical ethics to the professionals to and students in all. So the Yenapoya exactly Center uh, for Craniofacial Anomalysis PMPS. is an initiative and backed and, uh, by a team of doctors dedicated to the study of cleft uh, and craniofacial anomalies. So, okay. shall we wait for another five minutes if uh, you permit? No, pro no problem. I, I'm, listen, I am at your place. At Yanapoya, social responsibilities are taken seriously. Many community outreach programs and healthcare delivery programs have been chartered for this purpose. The university has a dedicated rural healthcare and development center which caters to 27 sub centers. The dental college has nine peripheral sub centers in rural and outreach areas. And Physiotherapy so College has one peripheral sub-center nice uh, with eight hostels for both men stuff. and women. Right. The campus hello, is well equipped You're muted, to provide so students with a memorable experience. Yes, said hello. Students focus on so overall development also. with the use and of sporting in, facilities in, um, around the campus, which includes so, in well-maintained sports ground, indoor stadium, and multi-gym, helping students to maintain uh, their physical well-being. So uh, the university boasts of an active I NSS see, so unit within, within with over 500 volunteers. So it's in Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Renaissance, okay. the students' the annual the cultural the extravaganza, I don't know is a platform for showcasing their talents in curricula and extracurricular activities. Along with being uh, an educational okay, center, Yenipoya is nature-friendly, um, green campus. Hello, the I Center for Environmental Sciences button, is dedicated hello. to the sustainable development course, of the welcome. university campus. One third of the campus is okay. glowing with green. The primary attraction being medicinal garden, the campus boasts of initiatives like rainwater harvesting, solar panels, drinking water and sewage water treatment plants. A central kitchen supplies sumptuous, hygienic food catering to all necessities. Um, Yenapoya campus houses a prayer hall, cafeteria, mini theater, laundry and daycare facilities. Education well, is the food um, for the mind, the body and soul. Um, and we are At Yanapoya, um, we deliver uh, the Dubai best of everything to help our young um, minds enlighten themselves, in India. making a difference and to the world by God's as we grace, know it today. Uh, super successful. Very enlightening Discover for your world at Yanapoya, well. harnessing so, the power um, of knowledge. I thank God for that and all my teachers and a uh, few of them are right now on. Next time, if Dr. Sripati Rao is coming on, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Malingabert and other folks to join us. He really wanted to, but I didn't think I sent him a link, so he might not be in today, but he would be happy to join us. Uh, so um, we have done that 150 hours over a period of approximately nine months. Well, now it's uh, COVID times.
everything is special so it's extended to probably a year year now and then beyond that 31 of them are doing a full mastership as well and that is 250 hours more so the total of 400 hours specific to pain and um, or official pain and sleep apnea uh, type of treatment so i will probably um, be able to project a couple of slides uh, of that course which is coming up in november the next class and this time it will be at least starting online um, and believe me i work my behind off for that course and so do my co-lecturers and especially uh, shankar um, dr shankar ayer who is uh, uh, my partner in the field um, and he's been instrumental in bringing a lot of um, um, continuing education beautiful courses and he was kind enough and i tagged up with him so i'll show a couple of slides of that at some point to whoever is interested in a solid foundation course um in our official pain as a matter of fact i have my lecture i think we have one more session right sonia for yana point yes sir yes sir it'll be on sleep medicine so one month from now or something yes sir and then i think next week we have one for the world dental organization which is uh yes kathix And Artics. then there is one on digital think, chemistry. Yeah, with uh, uh, Dr. Sonal. Up. With Sonal. Yes. So yes. something that maybe the audience are not familiar with. I want my students in almost every program that I, I encourage them joining me, uh, co-lecturing with me. If whatever they organize, they have a spot. Um, I do not believe in just uh, pushing myself on the stage. It's not the right thing to do for me, at least. So I am open to. any student of mine co lecturing with me the only thing i do is i um look at the slides and maybe suggest some changes that might fit the program and i'd be more than happy for any student of mine to join me wherever this arrange a program um and i think is the best teacher um uh, in a guru shishya relationship that we can have so i look forward at some point if i can present something maybe with dr shripati rao or, or maybe with one of those teachers it would be amazing to to present something um i don't know what conference but by god's grace it'll happen at some point so um <clears throat> who else is here uh dafer is come saying hello from saudi hello dafer um i'm not sure if uh, he's part of the ksa group kingdom of saudi arabia group that i am a member of i'm not sure but anyway hello i know has joined from dubai i know how are you i don't know if you are on audible but i just want to say hello um who else is there hi sir ahana here ah ahana how are you uh, by the way ahana is one of the uh, mastership candidates i hope by god's grace uh, january february she'll be finishing the full 400 hours I'm very proud of these batches of students because they took a challenge. Uh, this is not e- easy, and this requires a lot of, uh, like any other specialty, a lot of um, commitment and perseverance. impact factor and i really really uh recommend that any student in a, in any of these programs i i really wish and i hope and um i encourage them um to publish 
um, if possible with me. So, Sonal, you're okay? Everything good? I see that you're in a full gear. Yes. I'm in a clinic right now. It's still working time for us. That's absolutely fine. Is there an N95 I see? Yeah, N95. No, no, double mask. I'm all covered right now. Surgical mask. Yes, correct. By the way, um, <clears throat> I heard the latest um, recommendations. They don't recommend a uh, surgical mask over an N95. Um, it's an evolving thing, so don't get me wrong. Two weeks from now, they say, no, 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 put it back on. So, back on. You're pro, you're pro, so because it's a very evolving hour, field. Things to learn. <laughs> it is a very evolving field. And, and uh, talking about orofacial pain, we're seeing a lot of changes in the pain characteristics uh, that we, we know from this COVID patients. Um, anything with COVID is now gold to publish. So um, I'm looking forward to those cases. They, um, I hope nobody loses a life, but in the US, they're dying at at least 1,000 people a day. Um, it's become so numb, we have become numb to it. Every day you're looking at it, oh, 925, okay. Less than yesterday, because it was 1,300 yesterday. India's catching up fast. I wish it did not happen, but I think we are really looking at a horrible pain picture, but we will overcome it. That's my feeling. So yes. Vishak Suku has joined. I just want to say hello. He's from Kollam. He has joined. And uh, I think we're coming to the 10, 10 mark timing. And I will have, uh, I'll stop now. And anybody uh, wants we to welcome uh, Dr. Lakshmi Khan Satra, Vice Principal in the Dental College, oh. moderator of today's session. And Dr. Sanas Shetty, HOD, yes. and Professor, yes. Department of uh, Prosthodontics another moderator who is looking after the YouTube link here. Welcome okay. you both. And namaste to you all. The first one I recognize that name. I think he's from Manipal, is he or no? Maybe I, I got it wrong. Dr. Chatre, he's from Manipal? Yes, yes. yes he is. Hello. Yes, Lakshmi Kanchatra. You are right Hello. there. Oh you yeah, that's you. Oh my yeah. Lord, long time no Hi. see. Long time no see, how are you? My good, good. Are you you're also settled in Mangalore then? Like right? you're the long way. Yeah. Oh my god. So nice to Mangalore. see you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Brings back my memories from 25 years back, man. Oh my lord. That's true, that's true. Amazing. Quite a long time back. Yes. Good, good. Um yeah. it's it's the same thing like you are stuck at home, yeah. um, you know, between practice and university and Doing yes. everything, teaching on online right now. So that's right, that's right. nice to nice see to you. you yes. Do take care. I'm sorry. I'm yes, you too. Speak now. Yes. Uh, I'll let go. I'll stop talking, and then when I am prompted, I'll start talking. Yes. 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 Done. I'm good. Okay. So, uh, with your permission, sir, a very good good evening and uh, good morning to all my friends and delegates from India and US. And Dr. Hari Kishore Bhatt and uh, Dr. Uma is also co-hosting this uh, from Center for, for Penetration Anomalies from Enupad uh, Dental College, Enupad into the University. We extend a warm welcome to all. We are fortunate to have with us today two international speakers of repute, Dr. Davis Thomas and Dr. Sonia Bhatt from uh, US and LLN respectively, who have graciously accepted our invitation and agreed to share their expertise with us. At the very beginning, I, I would uh, invite Dr. Akhtar Hussain, Dean, Principal Enopa Dental College, uh, to give his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Dear members of the faculty, graduate students, interns, external delegates, our guest faculty, Dr. Davis, Dr. Sonia, Dr. Hari Kishore, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, a very good evening to you all. I'm actually very happy that Center for Craniofacial Anomalies, you know, in association with the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery and Prosthodontics of our Enterprise Dental College, organized this seminar. And two important topics, both of which are relatively less understood and in an area where even expertise is less available. It's a matter of pride mm -hmm. that both the resource persons today are our own. In the sense, Dr. Davis Thomas, I remember him as a staff member in Dental College way back in 1992. 
who I am sure had to work hard to reach where he stands today. He has worked, you know, yeah, he's like, I can, he should be actually an example and inspiration for the youngsters today. And uh, I am very proud that his achievements in the field of oral facial pain and sleep apnea, which as I mentioned, are emerging specialities in the field of dentistry. Dr. Sonia Butt is our alumni from the Department of Prosthodontics, and she's pursuing a fellowship in oral facial pain and sleep apnea. Very nice meeting you guys. And I welcome you all to this webinar. And I have no doubt that this will be, one, this will be of immense benefit to both students as well as the faculty. Dr. Davis will join us again, as I understand, next month to speak about sleep apnea, another very important area. And thank you very much, Dr. Davis, Dr. Sonia, uh, for accepting our invitation and sharing your expertise with us. And I'm hoping to see more such you know, interactions with you guys in the years to come, in the days to come. And whenever you happen to come to Mangalore, India, don't forget to visit us. All right, thank you very much. Over to you, Doc. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Akhtar Sen, sir. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Davis Thomas to all of you. Uh, he finished his BDS in the prestigious uh, KMC in 1992 and went on to do the DDS in uh, New, New York University College of Dentistry in 1994 and uh, got his master's in sleep medicine from University of Sydney, Australia and master's in clinical pain management, University of Edinburgh, UK. He's a diplomat and a fellow in American Board of Orofacial Pain. Presently, he's the assistant uh, clinical professor in Rutgers University, New York, uh, USA, and assistant clinical professor, uh, Rochester Medical School, USA, and a visiting faculty in Manipal Academy of Higher Education, and a distinguished professor in Sechonov Medical University, Moscow, Russia. Uh, we have uh, with us Dr. Sonia Bhatt. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sonia Bhatt. Dr. Sonia Bhatt completed her BDS from Abhishekti Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences, Mangalore, and Masters in Prosthodontics from our own Enapoya Dental College. And currently, she is pursuing fellowship in orofacial pain and sleep medicine from Roseman University under the mentorship of Dr. Davis Thomas. Dr. Sonia Bhatt is currently working as prosthodontist at New Al Salam Orthodontic and Dental Center, LN, UAE. She is a speaker at CME in LN and Abu Dhabi since 2015 on various topics of prosthodontics. I welcome Dr. Davis Thomas and Dr. Sonia Bhatt. I welcome all the delegates, moderators to the program. Over to you, Dr. Davis Thomas and Dr. Sonia Bhatt. All right. Um... <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. And I know some of them are joining from the US. So for them, good morning. And Sonia, for you, good afternoon, I guess. There's a lot of timelines that is spanning this one. There's a lot of time so, zones we are covering. Yes. Yeah. So hello to everyone. Um, at the beginning, I just want to request, unless the uh, moderators can do it, if everyone can mute their microphones. So there's no hindrance and I don't have to go back and forth. I humbly request that you mute. Uh, unless you have a specific question, then please unmute, identify yourself and you can ask the question, no problem. The, the whole idea of doing this is uh, not to teach, uh, you know, how to, um, uh, how to diagnose or start to manage these cases. As we mentioned, uh, Sonal and Sonia, all these folks are you doing the 150 hours, and then there's so much to learn. This is an ocean of knowledge, like any other specialty. Um, I'm so happy to be um, in this group. I first of all thank um, <clears throat> the dean, the management, and uh, Dr. Sripati Rao um, and the other faculty, <clears throat> including Hari Kishore, who was very nice enough to. Uh, go back and forth with me and I have a busy schedule and so does he, but he persisted and uh, we got this straightened out. And I thank Sonia for being facilitative to um, arrange this as well. 
she's my student but she's also a guru and you can learn from anybody <clears throat> so i thank all of the uh, faculty that have joined us and the students and my colleagues and, and classmates. Um, I'm going to try to share the screen now. I hope it works as fast as many others. Let me just see your entire screen. I think I should do that. Uh, maybe not. Let me just see how it works present now. A window. Let's see. Um, can you see the screen now? All you guys? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, so thank you. So um, this is a short presentation and I will not steal all the time. I want um, Sonia to give her um, rendering as well. And I'm happy to join her to give uh, some of this, um, probably something new or maybe a re little refreshment for a lot of those of you who are listening. So <clears throat> I always say in my lectures, and this is something I've stood by very much, um, I love this um, quote uh, from the scriptures, Tamasoma uh, Jyotirgamaya, which pretty much has been my guiding principle since I joined dentistry in Manipal in 1987. And professors like Dr. Shipit Rao and um, my colleagues and other teachers have done wonderful for me um, in um, allowing me to learn this more and more. Um, I still remember their lectures. Um, they really have inspired me to do what I'm doing now for the last 14 years I've been teaching um, at various schools and, 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 and medical schools and stuff. And they were my inspiration. So I just do the mistake to them. Um, as I, as this says, um, this is absolutely true that the ignorance and the darkness of ignorance to take it away from us, we don't need to struggle at all. Just bring a little bit light of the knowledge into that darkness and it passively has to disappear. There is no stress necessary to, uh, get rid of, um, our, our, um, darkness of ignorance. Um, it's a colloquial saying, but I love this uh, quote. <clears throat> what is the scope of this presentation between Sony and I? Well, it's just a broad overview. And my view has changed since I started this um, journey through orofacial pain in, back in 2005. And discuss the most common clinical entities and scenarios as much as time allows us. Um, I have to tell you this. This is not to uh, prepare anyone to start um, either working up a case of orofacial pain. This is pretty much meant to say when you need to rethink the case. I'm not sure of any branch of dentistry that is not associated with orofacial pain, I'm sure. As dentists, we are in the business of inflicting pain and then relieving it and, and then some more. So uh, I, I do urge that, uh, my students colleagues and my teachers, at some point, they look into the science that is now evolved into the 12th specialty of dentistry. And we must know when to refer and who to refer to. So the question I get usually is, which I've had that because our course is coming up in November, you know, when do I start treating a TMJ, TMD or facial pain? If we treat uh, and manage cases, uh, or begin to manage until the three years or two years or whatever they complete. An orthodontist maybe is not well equipped to uh, complete cases and still baffles them. And any other uh, prosthodontist doing a complete um, implant case or even just full dentures upper and lower, it is not easy. So there is no right time. You evolve into it. That's the answer. Because I've gotten so many texts and Facebook requests for what do I do? What do I do? Well, the first thing is take a course that is um, solid. And I, I, I'm proud of my course being a solid one with Smile USA and Rosemond University. I have to put this up in the past couple of months. I had experiences where I have done a, quite a few international grand rounds of two hours each, bringing in the pioneers in this field into education for like 30 plus countries around the world. And we have done it consecutively for the past several months. 
And it is my experience that at least some of the listeners would listen to these slides, take a picture of the slide, maybe take a picture of a, a, a panoramic or something, and then say, okay, now tomorrow this case is coming to me. I have to try to manage it. It is not so. And don't be fooled by what the simplicity of the slides. I wanted to make it that way because it's just making it easier for us to understand, especially the beginners, the novices amongst you. So this is not meant to aim to teach anyone to start doing diagnosis and treatment of orofacial pain. We are not there. And it's not substitute for the course that I teach, the 150 hours or the 400 hours. Um, it's not a substitute. And there are some courses that do like 30 seminars, 50 seminars and webinars. Really, that's not it. In that case, oral surgery or prosthodontics or orthodontics could have been taught over seminars. It's not gonna work that way. You need hands-on and that is what the course I teach is all about. Um, what is the scope of orofacial pain? Well, the scope is this, TMJ, TMDs, which is what the public's awareness of orofacial pain is about TMJ and TMD. They think this is what it is. I have to tell you from my little experience and my humble feelings and, and learning that I've done over the last few years, this is the smallest component that we have. This is really easier for us to diagnose, probably to manage too. This is not orofacial pain alone, but many of the cases are TMJ, TMD cases. Neuropathic pain, now the actual orofacial pain starts. Trigeminal neuralgia, neuropathies of the face, uh, painful post-traumatic uh, post trigeminal neuropathies. Um, these are the terms that are coming out in the literature recently and still changing. So that's the scope. Neurovascular, uh, we have cases that we have seen through our programs uh, in Mumbai and Bangalore and such that these Cases come in with tooth pain, and they're scheduled for bondings, fillings, root canals, extractions, grafts, uh, because we are not educated in this. And in the end, with probably an hour's time, you begin to realize that the toothache is because of a migraine of the face. I get this uh, um, question from students, what? Migraine? Yeah, of course. There's something called facial migraine or mid-face migraine which actually really resembles a toothache. And I cannot begin to think how many patients for the lack of this knowledge have been hurt and have been mistreated without knowing. It's not a, a dentist's fault because we are not taught that way. So neurovascular programs, um, entities. Then you have more complicated ones, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. What does that mean? Headache that appears on the teeth with an autonomic feature. Um, as you know, autonomic features meaning congestion of the nose, uh, flow, tearing of the eye, um, redness of the eye, color change, temperature change. We were not taught and we are still lagging behind in dentistry very, very pathetically. And that's what we want to change if we can. Non odontogenic toothaches, the course, uh, the lecture that's coming up in Manipal um, is going to focus on pain referrals. What are the chances and the mechanisms of pain referrals? We won't get the chance over an hour and a half. I'm going to simplify it. But if you want to learn it that way, then take the course. That's very high, that's higher level. And I mentioned of snoring and sleep apnea. Both of these are eventual killers. There is no doubt in our minds. The literature is very evident over the last 20 years. Hundreds and hundreds of publications, um, not just observational studies, case reports, but also systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and even more RCTs, randomized clinical trial control trials. And it has to be that the literature should be the king, not something that somebody just says. And my favorite is uh, also a sleep and pain association with sleep and pain. That was my thesis also for one of the masters that I have happened to have. And of, of my big interest is systemic factors in orofacial pain. This is my, my phenomenal um, topic that I really drive across to all my students, both at Rutgers, both at uh, Rochester, 
or the program in uh, that program that she is in. Uh, and then there are others. So this is the scope. And within the scope, you have so much to learn from the basic anatomy to the latest neurosurgical procedures in between that spectrum. <clears throat> and of course, clinical and basic science. And I urge people who join my programs to publish and publish now. So the question here is, um, what do you see? You see a sequential um, events happening in this patient. This is over a period of approximately uh, two years, a year and a half. Not my case, something that comes to us and gets published. So what do you see? The patient comes with a pain complaint, chief complaint of pain in the lower left quadrant. That is what you're looking at in this periapical, not very well taken except for the, uh, for the molar, obviously. The periapical is missing here. But why? Because the dentist was convinced that this is coming from what again? The molar. What is the normal thing they do? They do tap, tap, grind, grind, occlusal adjustments, uh, hold, uh, hot and cold, electrical, thermal, um, uh, testing. The literature is changing so fast on all of these. And I really urge you to start reading the literature. So not just for your patients, but for yourself, maybe your family member. They get hurt in the, like this, in this case. This case, then of course, the dentist is not trained. Within the limited knowledge and training he or she has, he or she proceeds with the root canal of that tooth. Not, pain is not subsiding. So whatever missed in this case, and you know, we can ask so many questions. Did you do this? Did you do that? Understand these are not just um, one dentist. This is then involved with multiple dentists. So the training is my core there. It's not the problem with the dentist, but the way we train. As you notice, not only the root canal was done, completed, right? They also did a filling over again. This is made into composite. So that was one attempt to, in an attempt to alleviate the pain. And this is not an exception. This is the norm. This is what we see. I teach at Rutgers and every Wednesday and Friday. This is all we see. Yesterday's case was just mind boggling. Three cases, three cases. But Rutgers University is a tertiary care center. It's the only dental school in the most thickly populated state of New Jersey. And I'm a faculty there. So we get the really referred tertiary messed up cases. This was multiplied in that cases that I saw yesterday. One side of the teeth are missing. When do we really stop? When do we try to study? When do we step back and say, maybe I'm doing something wrong? So it continues on the saga. One root canal is done here. Then the filling is done. And then it goes to the next dentist because saying this one is stupid. Let's go to the next dentist. He or she knows it better. And in our um, immense lack of that training, then what, what happens next? Well, you go on to say, okay, that did not work. Let me do this root canal again. So as you see, the post is taken out. The root canal is done all over again. The whole thing. By the way, this was an endodontist. Any of the endodontists listening out there, it is, we are no, no branch of dentistry is exempt from this, only because we did not have the training. And that is what I'm driving across. If you guys listening to the faculty, listening in the Yanapoi and other dental schools and other countries have some clinical pearl, please start a program that is even limited. Somebody should be trained in this, in a scientific method. Of course, it did not stop there. They finished the root canal again, completed it. Um, then somebody said the filling might be. The thought process is this. How can a dead tooth hurt after you pump in so much of sodium hypochlorite, uh, hydrogen peroxide, whatever the else we use? How can it hurt? But there is a mechanism that it can hurt. And it's not cold sensitivity. It's something else. And there's a panoramic showing. Again, this is not an exception. This is the norm. Every single day, I get heartbroken seeing cases like this, if only they knew. 
the natural consequence of this will be extraction of these teeth way down. But an orofacial pain specialist gets this case and then steps back and say, okay, let's do something else. This was a case of pre-trigeminal neuralgia. Pre-trigeminal. What? Yes, there is a term. Pre-trigeminal, right? Neuralgia. And I think, I'm not so sure if it was maybe um, when I was with um, Manipal, we got an excellent lecture on trigeminal neuralgia, I believe from either Dr. Karepa or Dr. Sripati Rao, and it was phenomenal. But I did not have any clue that there is something probably called pre-trigeminal. And I think at that time, the literature probably did not even say it. This is a newer one, that you're on the way to trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, people like Yaya Sharaf, whose textbook we follow to heart, he talks strongly about it. And I brought him into my international grand rounds. The next one we're scheduling, I let Yenapo and your faculty know, please join those type of programs. You're going to listen to the pioneers in this field. And I'm a little guy. I'll talk to a little bit, but the rest of them will talk. You need to listen to Sh Raya Sharaf, Dr. Eli Eliav, and folks like that. So we will facilitate. Please join us. And now, what do you see in this? Now, my students know this slide. And I get these answers. I'm not sure how interactive Google Drive is, but I would ask them, what do you see in this slide? What sticks out at you? Not my students. Um, Dr. Akhtar, are you, are you familiar with this platform? Does it allow us to react, interact, or no? Or maybe... Um, um, not, not, not exactly, sir. OK. They cannot respond, but, right? Maybe in typing, probably, right? Yes, yeah, so we can, we can okay. unmute ourselves and you know, switch on the video and, and do that. OK. Um, but you need volunteers for that. Oh, volunteers. I can pick <laughs> in my courses anyway. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't want to um, make anybody uncomfortable by you know, volunteering. I mean, by uh, picking someone. So the baseline is this. Uh, you know, this case, for example, is sitting in my chair in my um, uh, office in, um, in southern New Jersey. And she's in pain. She's in pain on the front teeth right here. And she's telling me, Dr. T, I was referred to you by the oral surgeon. So there's a very conscientious oral surgeon. His name is Dr. Feeney. He, his office is like three blocks from mine. This case was referred to him for evaluation and extraction of this tooth here, this one, the upper left central incisor. I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't know where the pain is coming from. Let Dr. Thomas see this case. So stat referral from a conscientious, very good oral surgeon. What sticks out from this panoramic is not that this does not have any pathology, and Dr. Feeney was right not to touch this tooth, but the fact that how can you have one set of the teeth loose because of periodontal disease, decay, and the other side all being okay? Basically, this patient had unilateral pathology. How is it possible that 11 dentists who saw this case, including two oral surgeons, of course, the second one referred to me, two periodontists, no orthodontist because this was not uh, an alignment case at least, um, occlusion specialists, three of them, that ground the teeth down over a, this, this tragedy is making of three and a half years of suffering for this patient. Three and a half years of suffering. Of course, needless to say, it's a lawsuit because this was done for absolutely no dental reason. We had a definitive diagnosis and we actually managed the case very successfully, but I did not judge any other dentist. That's one thing I tell my students too. Even if you see this happening in a patient, do not judge the other dentist. You don't know what happened there. So I'm not in the business of judging the 11 of them that came before me, but I was pretty sure that this in the US, this will end up in a lawsuit, and it, it did. So it's not a question of that legality. It's a question of um, can you learn something new? There is no way pedal disease can be one side of the, of the mouth. There is no way they can just go in and jump it unless maybe, maybe if you extend it, 
um, maybe in a radiation case, maybe, maybe, but nothing like that in this case, nothing even close. So what made 11 general dentists turn surgeons and uh, periodontists and uh, prosthodont pro three prosthodontists involved? What would make them think that this is a dental case and my implant will be better than his implant or her implant will be better than my crown? That type of thought process. And that is why they are in the lawsuit. So my point is this. This is not a case that I would like to uh, teach anyone here in, in the limited, limited time we have. But the point is this. We need to prevent this from happening. And this is not the exception. The next case. This is my my um, Dr. Eliav, my mentor's case. What is happening here? How many people have to work on these cases to do multiple, multiple root can all done very well, by the way. And this is not a morphed one. This is an actual case. And they only did, uh, they only did 28 root canals. Guess why? Because there was no 29th tooth. That's why. So they, they stopped there because there was no tooth left. What makes us do this type of thing? Again, the problem is we don't have the knowledge. We don't have the, uh, the science that is being taught to us. And that is what I'm humbly trying to change uh, because it happened to a couple of my friends and family members too, not my immediate family, but it's still happening. And that made me think in back in 2003, 2004, 2005, and here's where I am right now. I don't have the answers to many questions, I mean, many of these cases either. These that I'm showing you, we have the answers. So when do we stop? What makes a patient hurt all the teeth? So much literature, so much literature. Please let us stop this. Again, what do you see in this case? Upper left teeth all have been root canals, crowned. Lower left root canal, crowned, and then pulled out with a, with a graft. Thing to do with orthogenic pain, nothing at all. But who knew? This is the work of four dentists, back and forth. And of course, when you find out, the patient finds out that this is not my case, by the way, it was published. And of course, it was a litigation in California. Not that. The question is, how can we stop doing this to our patients? How can we stop doing this to our dentists? They are put in a situation where uh, they, you know, we look like we don't know what we're doing. This is a case of a cluster headache that refers to clusters, by the way, when we go back, it, it comes under um, trigeminal autonomic left cephalagia, that features. So cluster headache, referring to the teeth, causing this patient to seek treatment. Dentists have no clue. We were not taught this. That's the tragedy. And we're still not being taught. What do you see here? These are three of my assistants who I take on a trip to, for them to learn uh, because I was lecturing at American Academy of Orofacial Pains. Um, and I remember one of them telling me that, Doc, I get TMJ clicks and pops all the time. My three dentists, they are all dental assistants, so they worked for dentists before. And my three dentists made me different, different types of night guards, just calling them night guards. So I'm like, one night guard better than the other? No. I mean, there are people who teach the science of night guard. What is the science of night guard? There's nothing such as that. And I want to change that perception by literature, not by me saying something big and I'm a big guy. No, nothing like that. But night guards are what they are, night guards. I mean, they have some value in our facial pain, but my night guard with a ramp, your night guard with a canine rice, other night guard in group function, where is the evidence? There is no evidence. There is some evidence of what it does. So if somebody tells you my night guard works better than his night guard, please ask them politely, where is the evidence? Did you do a study? Did somebody do a study? Was it control study? Who was the controls? I want to see the literature before I put this on my patients. Night guards are just what they are. They're night guards. They're not going to treat or official pain much at all if anything. So then we fought a fight for the last, let's say 30 years because of the politics involved in this thing and something else and other than that, which I don't want to go into details of it. 
I came to this in 2005, but people like Dr. Gary Hare, my mentor, clinical mentor, he's been in this fighting for 30 years. So I didn't suffer much, he did, and people like him did. So there's so many with American Academy for Official Pain that tried their best, went through the hula hoops, did the dance, fought for it with their top of the lungs, and they came out with one good result. And that was the best result that happened in dentistry that I think in the last 25 years. This is the best. Because ADA then said, okay, now we understand that and the National Commission on Recognition of Dental Specialties in the US, which has becoming the standard of care for a lot of countries. I'm not sure how it is in India, but I think the Dental Association of Dental Council might look into it, or I'm hoping they already looked into this. This is the 12th specialty. Um, so, and I think it was so much overdue for the suffering of millions of patients, millions. Now we have some guidelines and those guidelines will be by the American Academy of Oral Facial. If anyone is interested, the next um, world conference will be in Arizona, uh, the state of Arizona in the US. I'm one of the plenary speakers in it which God has blessed me with it. After these many years, they said, okay, he's pretty okay. Let me, let's take him as a plenary speaker. And I thank the Academy for it. So this is the conference you will have, you will love to attend. I urge the faculty post COVID, hopefully that happens post COVID. It is, I believe in uh, April or May of 2021, hopefully post COVID, and you attend the best conference in the world on orofacial pain, TMJ, TMD, orofacial pain, sleep medicine. It's an enchilada. It's a margarita served all around the clock. So I urge you to attend this um, conference that is coming up in 2021. <clears throat> so it was declared specialty. Then the question is this, that I get from India, from Philippines, from UAE, from how do I become an OFP specialist? Well. Those cases you saw are not for general dentists. They're not for any specialty under the umbrella of dentistry except OFP because we are not taught. And all of the specialists on the committee, they have recognized it. They understood it and they said, listen, pain is a separate entity. So let's, talk. by the way, that will be a beautiful interaction if there are um, there are endodontists amongst you. I would love to hear from you because we love you for the treatment you do, but you begin to love us for differentiating dental and non-dental origins. Oral surgeons out there, they have a big role to play. I lecture for oral surgery program at Rutgers and Dr. Vincent Zicardi is nice enough to ask me to uh, lecture for them and he lectures for our program. That is the cooperation and the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary treatment for the management of the patient that we might need. Evidence-based, evidence-based, that's the key. And that is what I'm proud of. That is what we are starting in November coming up. I'll have some uh, highlights. Please look into this course or some other course that is evidence and literature based that will not hide facts from you. Document your continuing education. Visit American Academy of Oral Facial Pain's website. 31 students of mine will be, as much as I understand it, eligible to take this exam. American Board of Oral Facial Pain as of next year. And they will be the pioneers in India. They will be the pioneers in India. You can learn much from them as well. Remember, at some point, I see them as colleagues, not just as students. And don't be surprised to see, like you're seeing Sonia today with me, they'll be with me in the course teaching this stuff. So I urge you to look into good programs and continuing education that can accentuate your knowledge. Tamasoma Jodhir Gama is very true. Um, and then there is IASP, International Association for the Study of Pain. These are the courses we are teaching. Dr. Ayer has been very um, forthcoming and helpful so much. Um, there's so many objectives of these courses. As I said, this would be 2020, nice date. 
um, at least we'll be having a real, real feast on that day. Um, and probably the following day too, I'm, I'm building that up. Remember, the 150 hours that you're seeing here is not regarding anatomy and physiology. It's regarding the anatomy and physiology of one thing, pain, and a little bit of sleep medicine too. That's my faculty. This is Dr. Gary Hare, by the way. And I think, please look into the program and see if it's worth it for you. Oh, and oh contacts uh, are here. Dr. Um, Satish Devrajan from Chennai. Phenomenal guy. He will help you out. Uh, Balaji from Chennai and Arlene. So please look into these things. And I'll bring it up to whoever who wants information on these things. There are bizarre cases that come up. Bizarre, bizarre cases. And these are not new to me, but these are new to my students who do the program. So the case from Chennai, Dr. Vaishnavi uh, Prabhagas uh, case. It was probably looked up as uh, bruxism and abnormal jaw movement. Turns out the case is not bruxism and abnormal jaw movements. It's a type of Parkinsonism. It takes some time and it takes some knowledge and expertise to get to that level. That's what I'm going to teach you. And that's what please look into these type of things. TMJ pain in a 17-year-old uh, you know, male. The surgeon, board certified, said, ah, oh, must be because of the wisdom tooth that is impacted. I'm yet to find this type of literature where a wisdom tooth that is has no oral communication, which is sitting inside the jaw with no cyst or any even cyst don't hurt, but if it does, fine. No infection, it's an impacted tooth completely creating pain. What are we talking about here? And then the other thing is the wisdom tooth pushing all the front teeth together, causing crowding of the teeth. We say these things inadvertently, but wrong. Where is the literature? And this case turned out to be what? Cancer of the brain. That's what was referring here. Cases these come up and open our eyes. Needless to say, what the two dentists involved in this case, the kid has probably six months live because the glioblastoma uh, near the cortex. So you can imagine what that parents go through and the patient goes and the family go through. Of course, the li patient's license is probably not going to be there for more long because they treated this case without referring the case. If you did not understand the case, what is wrong in referring the case? So the question is who to refer. That's what I'm going to show you and hopefully you can understand that. Then there was an 82-year-old New Jersey female. This is just representative cases, headache and pain in a new 82-year-old. Guess what she was diagnosed with? Migraine. All my students in my 150 hours and in the 400 hours, they would understand that an 82-year-old cannot have migraine. Definitely not a new onset migraine. So the physician says migraine, right? On an 82-year-old, what are the chances? And this patient was seen uh, both in India and here. What are the chances? It's nothing new. This was a case, of course, of a tumor of the uh, of the uh, pituitary pituitary tumor, creating headache and TMJ pain. Next case number four, TMJ and facial pain from my student in the mastership course, Dr. Um, Prisley Thomas. We worked up the case together. This case was an eye opener for me after 15 years in this field. And we thought it was giant cell arthritis of the temporal artery. Uh, artery. The temporal arthritis is actually giant cell arthritis. I suggested a, a, a biopsy, but I told him something is not adding up. I don't know what it is. Guess what? It's Mockenberg's uh, medial sclerosis. We're publishing the case. My point is not that rare anymore. People are beginning to realize and recognize these things. This is from Kerala. And then the 13-year-old female for orthodontic treatment in New York, the orthodontist said, oh, anterior open bite because of tongue thrust. I mean, what are we thinking? Tongue thrust causing anterior open bite. So look up the literature. Is that the only cause? The literature is evident. No. The condas get distracted in a 13 year old. They'll have open bite. What, how? That's what I'm going to teach you in a course. 
this batch of students is the pioneers in India. I can tell you that with no doubt in my mind that they are going to finish the 400. And I want every one of them hopefully boarded with ABOP. They will be the pioneers. This is Prisley Thomas. This is Dr. Satish Devarajan. Please feel free to talk to them and find out what this field is about. More than I can tell you in an hour and a half. What are the organizations you want might want to know to learn this? International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP. American Academy for Official Pain. American Board for Official Pain. American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And the new one we just formed. And by January, I think there'll be a vibrant organization, including the whole of India and the whole Indian subcontinent and the whole of Eastern Hemisphere. That's my vision for this. And that's Dr. Ayers and my vision for that organization. Our aim will be succinct education, not just blah, blah, blah you know, in my hands this worked, somebody hands something else worked. Literature-based, evidence-based, science, truth-based, succinct education that's what we're looking forward to again recognition of the specialty is the best link that i have seen between dentistry and medicine this is the field so what is our issue well in the dental schools and i asked this in manipal i asked this in rishikesh i asked it in south india so many dental schools in central india and mumbai poor i asked them how many hours of actual pain education do we get in dentistry? I don't want to ask it to folks because it's, it's really um, demeaning for us to say, this is the US and Canada, actual study done in the US and Canada. How many hours of education? Zero to 24. What does that mean? There are some dental schools that there is zero. <laughs> Isn't it pathetic? Seriously. not extraction and then putting the patient on ibuprofen that's what i'm talking about i'm talking about actual pain physiology the actual pain types what are the referral patterns all this stuff the 400 hours that we teach where is it done never never in dental school that's why this is specialty but this is pathetic dentistry zero to 24 average in the us 15 hours pathetic nursing are much Medical folks are as pathetic as we are. So we have a big company, MBBS, like in India, they say. I can tell you, I asked some MBBS students, some said three, some said four. 16 is the highest level average, by the way. Nursing gets 31. And the joke is that we say, and with sort of pain in my heart, I have to say, veterinarians understand this. Physical therapists understand this more than we do. Veterinarians understand it way more than we do, like six times more, seven times more than we do. Pathetic, pathetic. Uh, 87 hours they get. So the joke is if you have a toothache, go to a veterinarian and you sit with the cats, the dogs, get the teeth looked at. It's the truth. It's abysmal. It's pathetic. Let's change it. Uh, and the competencies are also very limited in dentistry competency requirements in pain management there's no competency the maximum we do is what mandibular block look for the subjective and objective symptom what else do we do maybe post superior maybe infraorbital uh, submental but from that it has evolved into specialty and that's what i want to focus on uh, looking into this not everybody should join our official pain that's not the key but at least understand there's a specialty now in the making and there's a new sheriff in town. I don't have to patronize this crowd. You patient comes and complains of, um, you know, pain in the lower right when you eat. You understand that the pain is also when the patient is lying in a, sitting down for food, you get the picture. And then your focus shifts from this big lesion on this canine, uh, the cuspid, to this lesion. And it's very obvious on a occlusal view that's the cause of pain not this when the periapical is pretty okay too so that's one of the simple cases that we can see <clears throat> pmds is a small component of our facial pain it is not our most exuberant component but dentists who are not familiar with this field they make a big deal out of it oh here's tmj yeah they have two on the left side and on the right side 
they make a huge deal out of TMD and bite and adjustment of this and do this and that and then the other thing put something on the head and all the nonsense. It comes up. But what is TMD? It's a collective term. All right, that involves a mastectomy musculature, TMJs, and associated structures. So TMJ, by the way, is not a diagnosis. Please, let's not tell the patients that you have TMJ. Let's tell them you have two joints, temporal and joints, left and right side. It might also involve the cervical spine. That's why we teach cervical spine anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology of it very much in detail in the course. When you look at the TMJ, you understand, because this is the biggest question I get. Oh my God, what do you do for TMJ? What do you do for TMJ? Well, if it's a systemic issue, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, that type of stuff, okay, we have so much of stuff to do. If it's just a disc tear, okay, um, or if it's anterior disc displacement with reduction, which is a click back and forth, or a reciprocal click, do we need to treat that? And some schools say yes, and I'm asking them, where is the literature? Oh, you have a click. It will get into osteoarthritis wrong. Not in the literature. That clicks of the TMJ get into osteoarthritis. It's not there. So do we treat clicks? No. Do we have to treat clicks? No. So then when do we treat? Well, that's part of the course, which is pain or a new click with pain. Again, the key word there is pain. And again, I'm not patronizing anybody in the audience, but we need to go back to the basics and think about what structures here can cause pain. Well, we know that the disc cannot cause pain because there's no blood vessels. There's no nerves attached to the disc. Either side, there are tissues, retrodiscal tissue. Okay, that can cause pain, not the disc. The periosteum can cause pain, yes. Periosteum here can cause pain, yes. The, the superior lateral pterygoid, superior lateral pterygoid, yeah, can cause pain. Attachment of the disc, retrodiscal tissue can cause pain, yes. Attachment of the superior lateral pterygoid into the disc complex, yes. The disc itself, no. There's no blood. There's no nerves inside the disc, as much as we checked as of yesterday. So there's no pain in the disc. So these are the things that we really need to highlight and understand that click is not an issue. The issue is pain and probably degeneration, which we will talk a little bit time permitting. Another view of a dry specimen, freeze dry specimen, of looking at the what we call the superior and inferior joint space. It's not space there really. It's just a little attached area that if you pump a little air, yeah, it becomes a space. Or if it's in a cadaver like this, yeah, it becomes a space. And people talk about superior joint space, inferior joint space, as if there's a balloon in there. There's nothing in there. It's just a moist area. That's it. So please take it with a pinch of salt. When you hear superior joint space, inferior joint space, take it with a pinch of salt and you'll be fine. Um, there is standard of care, standard of care for orofacial pain. And it's not taking panoramics on everybody. It's not taking MRI, CT scan on every TMJ case that you see. There are consensus, there are guidelines, there are standard of care, which we one must adhere to because deviating from the standard of care is malpractice. That's a crime, that's unethical, that's immoral. And that's where the problem actually starts. When you deviate from the standard of care, now the standard of care in this field will be determined as much as I understand it by the American Academy for Official Pain and the other organizations, such as in the Middle East, probably in India, that will come to the AOP and say, listen, give us some guidelines, let's look into it. Not dictate, but give us. And there's a book that is published, Guidelines for, for um, or Official Pain. That's published. It's a 200 page book. Who knew? Well, if you don't look into it, you would not know. Role of occlusion in TMD. This has been one of the most controversial issues, not for me, but in, in the literature slightly, but in the dental field, oh Lord. So whose occlusion is right? Is it the periodontist occlusion? Prostodontist occlusion? Implantologist occlusion? Or is it the occlusion of a complete denture? Or is it occlusion of 
somebody from Florida that teach that this is my occlusion, somebody from some institute in Florida, an institute in Las Vegas, who do you believe? Because they're all different occlusions. For the orthodontists out there, including Dr. Akhtar, and he's a phenomenal orthodontist. I've seen his work for the short time that I was in Yenapoy. Phenomenal orthodontist, right? And he would answer this. How many patients, when you did orthodontics, would you see uh, ending up in severe TMD? Probably not. And I'm hoping not either, because it's not there. What do they do for a living, orthodontists? They change the bites. So is there any literature that said orthodontic changing bite over six months, one year, year and a half, two years, three years? Do they end up with uh, severe TMD? Probably nothing. Once in a while, we see this click happening, and that's why I said clicks don't treat them. Locks and pops pain, another question. That's an entirely different topic that I teach in the courses. What is the role of occlusion in TMD? Most of it is thrown out, debunked. Let's say 99% of it. Literature, evidence, science, proof. 99%. What is remaining? Eh, maybe a really high crown that the patient cannot bite down at all. Maybe. But where is it pain? Is it in the TMD area, TMJ? Or is it in the tooth? That's a different question, right? What does the tooth do if it's in high occlusion? Who told us any of these anyway? Where was the randomized clinical trials that are standard of care? It's the baseline for this in medicine. That's why medicine looks at us and laughs. Because we sit there and we just say like this, yes, your honor, give it to me. I'm ready to take it. We have been followers for the longest time. That has to stop. It has stopped already with the formation of this as a specialty. But let's think further into the future. Every dentist should know this, right? So what is the evidence of this? Uh, and in, in New York, there was a lawsuit against some orthodontists for this. And when we're looking at the case, we are like, no, orthodontists change bite all the time. That's how they live. Otherwise, their practice will close down. If, they, if, us, if, we tell us, if we tell them, you cannot change the bite because the patient will end up in TMD. Nobody thought this way. So one guy from Florida says something, okay, 1,000 people join him. Money making, that's a different thing. Some other guy from California says something, 1,000 people join them. From Delhi, some people join them. Bangalore, another occlusion, some people join them. Chennai, another people. Mangalore, something else. Within Karnataka, you can have three, four different occlusions. So what is the literature? Whose occlusion is correct? There's a joke that we say in a large general school, which is NYU. Right? So uh, and I think Shankar said it the first time, I think. Perio, prosto, uh, oral surgery, um, then the other branches are all there. A restorative, endo. So the question is, you know, what is the right occlusion? And guess what the answer is? It depends upon where the elevator stops. If you're stopping on the fifth floor, it's prosto. Define occlusion according to the prosthodontist. Fourth floor is perio. When you get out there, periodontists will define that occlusion. And when you, the orthodontics is, I think, eight. And the pediatrics is entirely different. It's absolutely different um, occlusal concepts in peds. So who is correct? And amongst that, there are different sections. So this is mostly debunked. Occlusion has its principles. And we need to do that core principles. Why? because we are gonna create something for this patient and that should be based on solid principles of occlusion and function and balance if you want that, like indentures, yeah. completely balanced, indentures. But students get so confused, balance, this denture, and then they go all over the place and say, oh my God, if the occlusion is bad, then they end up in TMDs. The reverse is true in our facial pain. Our most toughest cases are class one cases, not class two and class three. 
that's a tough one when you have a TMJ issue. Those are the tough cases that will test your ability, your knowledge, and your patience. There is look into it. Um, little evidence that occlusion is a primary etiologic factor. Very little. If my opinion, nothing. Zero evidence for this. And what is correct occlusion? Molar to molar? Premolar to premolar, the whole of Europe gets what? Goes from premolar to premolar. If you're losing all the teeth, they're saying, and you can look up the literature. Uh, Ash Shankar is the best prosthodontist I've known. <laughs> is he comfortable? Maybe he's becoming comfortable from premolar to premolar, second premolar to second premolar. What happened to the third molar to third molar? Nothing happened. It never was there, probably. So the molar to molar, some say, in the US, second molar to second molar. That's what we look forward to. Why? Because somebody said in the 60s that way? No. Let's question everything according to science, literature, and solid evidence. Let's question everything. And it says, then, it's, then they said, maybe a secondary factor perpetuating that needs to be addressed. Okay, we'll look into it. No problem. Diagnostic tests. Please look for anyone coming to you. Look for the reliability, validity, sensitivity, specificity of what equipment you're going to use to diagnose orofacial pain. The main equipment I want myself to have is between my ears and a couple of inches higher. That's called the brain of the clinician. And that's what I implore. Let's activate that. Let's activate all the brain cells as much as we can to look at these cases succinctly. And all these scanners and scammers, please get them out of your place. If there is no evidence, do not do them. You're doing a disservice to yourself, to the profession, and more than, more than that, to the patients and their families. And I, all these jaw trackers and all that nonsense stuff. So there is evidence that the other, other way is correct, that if you Use those trackers and scammers up with the wrong diagnosis or overdiagnose, overdiagnose. That's the that's the statement. And there's literature from the 1990s to 2020, in between everything. And I love uh, Shankar's quote on this. What do you want to use? A 50 cent articulating paper or a fifty thousand dollar articulating paper? Fifty thousand dollar articulating paper. Those are those scanners and stuff. Get them out. <clears throat> Again, my batch, what are the causes of clicking joints? Well, it doesn't bother me unless this is something to do with the last one that is listed here. So there's so many causes for clicking joints, right? Clicks, what, why do I hear a noise from my joint? Well, it's broadly accepted. That's the first clinical sign of disc derangement. I didn't say TMD problem yet, no pain. Disc derangement. Eh, what does that even mean? Disc derangement it means pretty much nothing. There could be people with condylar hypermobility. That's the lady that I showed you in the beginning. Because that girl with the index, I mean, with the thumb bent like that is hypermobile. She's the candidate that will have the TMJ issue. Not the regular, I'm not hypermobile at all. Very difficult for me to end up in a TMD issue unless it's so chronic with the trauma and stuff. It's not possible. There is no evidence, and that's a problem. Then the lateral pole of the condyle could be a little bit large, so the lateral ligament could be rubbed against as the condyle moves. That's possible. There might be a structural small little irregularity in the articular eminence. Possible. And in older individuals, 50 and above, 55 and above, 60, there could be some intra-articular bodies that could cause, and that's a problem. That needs attention. So out of all these, my attention will be on the last one. Intra-articular bodies, and we call it joint mice. That's the only thing out of these. Do not treat or manage a joint noise. It is not only not necessary, it's probably more detrimental to the 
education both health wise and the books and we are not scammers anyway so we don't do that none of us should do so what do you do about tmj tmd pain comes in patient comes in avoid shortcuts don't connect the patient's head and checks chest and everything else to a scanner and say okay let me see what the scanner says the scanner is here inside refresh the base of anatomy and physiology think is it really possible to have this click and have a huge occlusal problem is it possible let's look at the literature then let's look at the literature now and look for science evidence literature and truth please and of course a evidence-based program uh, that you can enroll in that's what you should look into and please cherish your teachers like i cherished mine uh i saw dr shikhi rao today i was so happy now i've been thinking of like saying hi i don't i didn't know where he was and someone told me he's a dean somewhere uh this was from a friend's friend's friends like that i couldn't search him out i'm not sure if he's on uh, facebook I, I guess not maybe he is but i was looking for my teachers that really inspired me the same way and he was so impartial to the students i loved it very few stick in my mind that way from very dental school through my three masters few glitter in the dark so cherish your teachers get a really good mentor that's what you need that is what i try to become for my fellowship students sixth batch and my mastership students i try to i do my best this is a mentor i just lost my first mentor dr henry gramian dean of louisiana state university An amazing guy amazing guy made me inject his tmj when i did not have a patient can you believe that how many mentors do you know that will ask to be seen as a guinea pig he says inject me i'm like i can't i'm from india doc i cannot inject you first of all don't call me doc what call me henry like it does not come out of my mouth i can't say his word that word out of henry he made me say it anyway but i couldn't i said no doctor no i'm not going to be then he says mark my my joint you can inject me we were doing what's called the auricular temple block i was shocked out of my pants what the hell is he talking about inject my guru but he proved to me that he is actual guru right so i really in front of him i'm like nothing so this is also god's blessing and of course my students i this is today so only lecturing so i'll stop here these are two of my students dr divya kohli and dr sunaina puri both manipal graduates and there you see a four star general of the indian army that invited us to lecture to them that is a commanding officer not uh, an enlisted soldier and and then one above him too uh, there was uh, uh, dr sanjay london general four stars so god's grace is amazing when you set out to do something and you learn it the way that nobody has done i think these students they shocked me by their and then we are going to look into what sony has to say today i'm going to stop for a moment and uh, i will now let my student and uh, soon to be my colleague hopefully dr sony but uh, i'll stop here and we are going to change uh, screens i will pause for a moment sony are you there yes sir i'm there i should allow you to share screen i'm thinking so i'm going to stop sharing I yeah and you can go on because i don't yes. see you now yes we'll i will do back. that by the way she's one of the brightest students i've ever had a uh, lot of questions i call her a question girl um but i love it my answers are short and she knows this but <laughs> that's me uh, because sometimes i get a little busy sometimes and then the answers become short so I apologize, but that's the beginning. So with no further ado, you're on. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's indeed an honor that uh, I'm 
co-speaking with my own mentor, Dr. Davis Thomas here. So I shall just start off with my topic without any further delay. Every part of the human body, uh, right from head to toe, has its own sensory innovation, barring few exceptions, of course. Now, head and neck is unique in many ways, and that's why it deserves a place of its own in pain speciality. A student of orofacial pain will do well to remember that within the orofacial structures, the head and neck, there are multiple sources of pain and not just one. There's an old adage which says that if all that one has is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Sir's presentation so far must have driven in that point for you people. Simply because it's quite often that we think only in terms of odontogenic pain. We have patients coming into our practice and they have a pain in and around the tooth. We assume it to be from a pulpal origin. So we start off with the endodontic treatment and patient's uh, pain does not get relieved. We do a re-endodontic treatment. If the pain still does not subside, we do not stop there. We go ahead and do a episectomy. And let's say patient comes back and says, my pain is still not gone. And then we have our last option, which is extraction. So what would happen if the pain comes, uh, patient comes back with pain in spite of our extraction? We have now reached the end of the uh, road. So this is the time we categorize the patient as a psychogenic case. Now, I am not exaggerating here because I have seen this in my own practice. In, in, I have seen it so many times and Sir has discussed it so many times. In such cases, what we need to accept is the limit of our own knowledge and not to categorize the patients in a box as a psychogenic case. A very warm good evening or good morning or to all of you out there. As everybody knows, I'm a proud alumni of uh, Yenapoya Dental College. I passed off from the prosthodontic department under Dr. Sana Chetty, and I currently practice in Aline Abu Dhabi. I've been pursuing my fellowship under Dr. Davis Thomas for almost a year and a half now. And by far, it has been one of my richest learning experiences. Sir is so humble and he, in every word, he is a guru. In the orofacial pain, diagnosing the case is much more difficult than treating itself. One needs to have a very good in-depth knowledge of all the basic sciences and at least know a little bit about all the other specialities. This in order to catch on to the enigmatic piece of diagnosis and fit it into the jigsaw. Our communication with the society, with the world is through our face. Our expressions of anger, fear, anxiety, everything is seen on the face. Even a just born baby without uttering a single word can communicate well. Apart from that, some of the basic life-sustaining functions, that is uh, breathing, chewing, and even speaking, they all happen through the face. So there's no wonder that these patients who have acute pain, they have such a sense of alarm with them. When it comes to orofacial pain, and when we have to study neuroanatomy, which is what I will be dealing with in today's lecture, we describe them under motor, sensory and autonomic nervous system. At the undergraduate level, we are taught very little of autonomic nervous system or we do not give it enough attention. It's only when I joined uh, the fellowship and we, I started reading orofacial pain in so much detail that I realized what a large role the autonomic nervous system has got to play in orofacial pain. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, would you like to say something about it? You're talking about sympathetic? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, as... um, yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Sonia. Uh, as I was saying before, uh, this, the connection between these, unless you know it really clearly, that ends up in a lot of misdiagnosis or missed diagnosis. Uh, one of the things they look for, we look for, is the involvement of, let's say, sympathetic or parasympathetic system um, in a patient that presents with toothache, as it looks like toothache. And the case in point here 
is sympathetically maintained pain. And we won't go into the details. Um, understand that sympathetically maintained pain is the pain that is being perpetuated and perpetuated by the sympathetic nervous system, which otherwise would be responsible for the uh, sympathetic uh, features of the skin and the, and the tissues. Um, so SMP is one of the topics that we really, really delve into in the course. Thank you, Sony. Yes, sir. Now, out of the 12 cranial nerves, 11 of which arise within the uh, cranial cavity within the brain, now each of these nerves can be potential source of orofacial pain. By nature, each of them have a very specific designated area of innervation. They could be purely motor, purely sensory, or a mixed nerve. Uh, that is, the, the same nerve fiber can carry sensory, motor, and autonomic nerve fibers. We are taught or trained to screen all our patients for all the 12 cranial nerves. It is very important not to miss out on one. When it comes to understanding the motor nerve, it's quite simple, but it's not the same with sensory and autonomic nervous system. Now, they are more difficult to understand, or how do I put it? They are more tricky to uh, get it. Let us first look at the motor nerve supply of the face. I have written here efferent somatic nerves. That means the impulses in the motor nerves travel from the brain towards the periphery. If you have noticed, I've written two terms, A alpha and A gamma. Once you start learning pain, you stop thinking of nerves just by their names. You start thinking of the component nerve fibers. And that's why I have mentioned it here. I will explain a little bit about them in detail uh, in further on slides. Facial nerve has a long intracranial course, and in its extracranial course, once it exits the sylomastoid foramen, it passes through uh, the body of uh, parotid, and its terminal branches supply all the muscles of facial expression. Now, these muscles are not involved in uh, movement of any joint or any bone. They are largely responsible for movement of the skin overlying them. They uh, encircle the three apertures or openings in the face, which would be the orbit, the nasal cavity, and the oral cavity. Today, I'm aware that there are a lot of oral surgeons uh, listening into the lecture, so I think they'll all agree with me when I say that in any surgery which is performed on the parotid, uh, at the end of the surgery, we always look for the intactness of the facial nerve, the motor uh, concept uh, the motor part of it they're asking the patient to do few facial gestures by like raising the eyebrows or smiling or grinning what we are checking is uh, post-surgery is the facial nerve affected there is a picture of bell's palsy on your screen out there it's one of the common idiopathic facial paralysis that you get to see where one side of the patient face normally it is unilateral gets affected and on the right side, you would see the nerve itself, the upper half of the face and the lower half of the face, especially if you consider the forehead part, it gets innervation from both the right and the left facial nerve. And the lower half gets its innervation only from the contralateral uh, facial nerve. In OFP, we need to be able to differentiate between an upper motor and a lower motor neuron lesion. But this is not the only pathology that we may see. Now, patient may come in with a herpes zoster infection and, and its uh, symptoms, or Lyme's disease, or a stroke, or even brain tumor, and they may look similar to a Bell's palsy. So you must be able to differentiate between them. Trigeminal nerve happens to be one of the biggest cranial nerves. And of its three branches, that is your uh, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, only the mandibular carries the motor nerve. Now, they, we all know they supply the muscles of mastication along with the anterior belly of diagastric, the mylohyoid, the tensor tympani, and the tensor palati. When we need to assess the motor branch of the trigeminal nerve, we do so by asking the patient to clench, and then we palpate the meseter on the 
bilaterally and we check for the bulk of the muscle. In case of trichomal nerve, it's a sensory a component of it that we are more concerned about in orofacial pain. I shall be dealing with them in detail. To assume that all the pain in the face comes only from these muscles is a great fallacy. Uh, OFP practitioner knows that a lot of pain comes from the neck muscles, back of the head, shoulder, the two of the bulkier muscles, that is your sternocleidomastoid and uh, your trapezius, they are supplied by the spinal accessory nerve. So when you want to test these muscles for sternocleidomastoid, you ask the patient to turn the head against resistance. And for trapezius, you ask the patient to shrug or just raise the shoulder. And this you do it with and without resistance. And that's how you would check the uh, neck muscles. I think until I started studying orofacial pain, I did not realize how important it is to examine the neck muscles, the back of the head. Uh, Dr. T, would you like to give your input on it? The thing that I would like to say is that these muscles, uh, especially the trapezius, upper trapezius, become what, what we call the master muscle. So in myofascially induced toothaches, which we will talk uh next time in manipal and then um probably after that the one coming up in yenapoy also we'll talk about a little bit about how they could be uh, seen in, in error um and missed in error and then um the, the clinician ends up in doing procedures for tmj and these are strong referral patterns with satellite trigger points that refer specifically preauricularly that's right in front of the ear and seen by an untrained dentist as, again, TMD. So you should be very aware. And yes, our courses, we do teach this really in detail. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, we just spoke about some of the major muscles, that is your muscles of facial expression and muscles of mastication. Of course, there are many other muscle groups, the ear, the pharynx, the larynx. Due to paucity of time, I'm not going to go into details of the nerve supply to these muscles, but please know that you must know the anatomy of these uh, muscle groups in order to understand its dysfunction. This term sensory, we have a very skewed or a very narrow view of the word sensory. That's why I put it up as a separate slide out here. We think of sensory nerve only in terms of pain. Sensory refers to somatic afferent. That means the impulses travel from the periphery towards the brain or towards the spinal cord. It refers to a whole lot of other terms, light touch, crude touch, temperature. Even within the pain, when the patient comes, we do ask, what's the quality of pain? What kind of pain do you have? Is it a burning pain? Is it a dull pain? Is it a pricking pain? Is it like an ice pick hitting you? Why would you ask that? Simply because we know that the entire sensory nerve has several other component nerve fibers. And each of these sensations, whether it's light touch or a temperature, is carried by a different type of nerve fiber. Uh, Dr. T, uh, am I right on this one? Yes, uh, and uh, what we teach you, as you know, is how to differentiate between um, when you screen for these various fibers, uh, C fiber that will probably uh, transmit through um, like chemicals or, or warmth as opposed to crude touch as well. And then A beta will be light touch and A delta will be the sharp pain. So we were taught this a little bit probably in undergrad, but in OFP, um, you really need to know this. Thank yes. you. Yes. So the somatic and the visceral sensory innovation of the orofacial region is primarily by the trigeminal nerve. Its branches, uh, that is the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, they have a very well-designated area of innovation. And I think, if not all, at least most of the uh, pain that we see in this region can be uh, traced back to one of its branches, that's the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal neuralgia, which is seen often in this area, is one of the most common demyelinating disorders. 
However, it is not the only disorder that you would see. You would get to see uh, disorders like headaches, some certain persistent kind of headaches, herpes zoster, sphenopalta neuralgias, PTT, and so I just spoke about it. So all these will be seen in the orofacial region, and somewhere the trigeminal nerve has got a role to play in it. Myofascial pain that Sir just spoke about. So a lot of literature has been written on myofascial pain, and the nerve is implicated in it somewhere. And you should know that these myofascial pain do get uh, um, referred to the teeth. So in the starting, when I mentioned that the tooth pain can just not be from the pulpal origin, there are so many other reasons where uh, the tooth pain can arise from. In the head and neck region, the nerve supply for the angle of the mandible, the back of the head, and the neck is not from the trigeminal nerve. They are largely by the upper cervical spinal nerves. So in this region, we would get to see things like occipital neuralgia, cervicogenic headaches, migraine, and of course, trigger point myalgia. So only when you are trained well to examine these muscles that you would know how they refer pain to other structures of the face. Oral cavity, of course, happens to be our forte, wherein the nerve supply is rich. Every part of it has a very specific nerve supply, whether it's teeth or its tongue, the floor of the mouth, pharynx, larynx. What I'm trying to say is you have to know the anatomy in detail. If a patient comes with pain in any region, you must know as to where, what is the nerve supply of that region, that specific area, so that you know what is causing that pain. When I started off um, with, uh, with my uh, studies under Sir, this was the only thing I had in my mind. That if I place a finger on any part of the head and neck or in the mouth, I should know exactly what nerve is supplying that piece. What is the exact anatomy of that piece? So if you reach that level of understanding, pain study would be easier. Tongue deserves a separate mention of its own, simply because tongue has a very unique nerve supply. The anterior two-third of the tongue, the general sensory, is by the lingual nerve. And the special sensory, which is the sense of taste, is by the caudal tympani nerve, which is a branch of facial. The posterior one-third is by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which also supplies a deeper part of the tongue and the throat. Burning mouth syndrome is something which we normally see in this area. Maybe in the patient in his late 50s, 60s, you would see it. You have primary and secondary burning mouth syndrome. Apart from that, you have patients who complain of distorted taste sensations or um, where one type of taste sensation is overriding the other. In these conditions, you would implicate corda tympani nerve. A lot of literature has been uh, written on uh, burning mouth syndrome. Sir, would you like to uh, share your uh, experience about burning mouth syndrome with us? Um, I think BMS, burning mouth syndrome, is probably one of the most um, unrecognized by dentists. Um, it, with horrible consequences. Um, we have had hundreds of cases and we've been publishing on this. Um, I think when you, you figure out that uh, taste alone is, you know, when we, we started looking at the literature, uh, I don't know if any dental school teaches, for example, where the, the receptors for taste on the tongue. Um, I know that uh, a long back, we used to have that diagram showing salt at the end of the tongue, some sugar on the top, bitter on the back. Nothing could be far from the truth than that. Uh, it is actually um, mediated. Taste alone is mediated by uh, the fifth cranial nerve, the seventh, the ninth, uh, and the um, vagus nerve, tenth as well. So four cranial nerves and some. And it would be surprising, at least for some, to know that uh, taste receptors for, for uh, sweet are not just on the tongue, they're on the palate, they're in the esophagus, they are also in the intestines, 
and even in um, the male genitalia inside. There is a reason that is there, and that's what we don't know, and we are really, really uh, deficient in these type of uh, thought processes in dentistry. And that's why this cannot be taught. Yes, sir. Uh, in a dental school, it has to be taught in a postgraduate, and that's where you are. But thank you. I, I, I remember you telling that uh, uh, testing the taste itself, it's it's a separate uh, work, work up in itself. Wherein Absolutely. I remember you showing that to us, how the, the sensation of taste is tested in the patient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. OK. Thank you, sir. Autonomic uh, nervous system comprises of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerve supply. Now, when me and Dr. T were first discussing about it, I told sir it's impossible for me to put it up in just few slides. It's a presentation topic in itself. And he said, it's not a presentation topic, Sonia. It's a textbook in itself. And he's so right. But I'll try to just highlight a few points. First up, let's see what the parasympathetic nerve supply is. Now, this supply is largely craniosacral in nature. These uh, nerves are famous for hitchhiking. That is, they hitchhike onto other nerves to reach their target area. Largely, we have the cranial nerve 3, the cranial nerve 7, your facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal, and the vagus, through which these preganglionic nerves reach their ganglion, which is your cilia ganglion, the pterygopaltine ganglion, the submandibular, and the otic. Vagus largely supplies the thoracic region, so I shall not be talking about it. And the postganglionic fibers from here reach the orofacial region. For the uh, salivary glands and the lacrimatory glands, they are secretomotor in nature. Sympathetic, on the other hand, is uh, thoracolumbar in nature. That is, the fibers come out of the thoracic and the lumbar region of the spinal cord, and they reach the sympathetic chain, and then the postganglionic fibers supply the rest of the body. Now, in this image, you can see I have put up both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division simply so that you can appreciate how both of them work on so many organs together. They do not have similar functions. I do not say that, but they do work uh, uh, together in so many ways. In terms of uh, sympathetic nerve supply, it's the superior cervical sympathetic ganglion, which we are concerned with, which supplies to the orofacial region. Now, both sympathetic and parasympathetic together control the secretions, the vascular smooth muscle tone, the intraocular uh, smooth muscles, and the thermoregulation. Now, though both uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic are motor in nature, they are still implicated in a number of painful conditions. Also, I want to mention something clearly here that even all the blood vessels of the body and the nerves of the body, they have a nerve supply of their own. You don't think about it, but you need to check out the, these terms called nervi nervorum and nervi vasorum. Now, so this uh, brings me to the the concluding part, wherein I would like to say that knowing the neuroanatomy is the very basic where you start understanding pain. You cannot understand dysfunction without understanding the function. So if you have understood what Sir has been trying to say and what I have been trying to explain to you is that our horse vision of uh, thinking that the nerve, uh, the pain can arise from tooth and tooth alone has to change. And probably the next time, a patient comes on your chair, you can at least think that, oh, there could be another source of pain other than the dental pulp. And if we can't treat them, we can at least refer them. You may lack in training. You may lack in knowledge or the fitness of your hand. But one must never, ever lack in empathy. All my patients I've treated now so many over so many years, they all come back to me. So it can't be just the handwork. You have to be genuinely concerned about the patient, show true concern, and try and improve your knowledge so the ultimate result where the patients get treated through us, they get the advantage of it. I would like to thank Yenapoya Dental College, 
for giving us this platform. It's it's indeed an honor for me because uh, the Department of Prosthodontics, where I passed out from, Department of Oral Surgery, and of course Dr. Hari and Dr. Uma, who have been instrumental in setting up this platform for us. Dr. Davis, of course, he is my guiding light in the field of oral facial pain. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, on the right, you would see they are my batchmates. They are my Mumbai uh, Fellowship batchmates, and they are they are really. Uh, they keep me on my toes. We keep discussing cases and literature back and forth, and it's so much fun. And I would like to thank my family because without them, this whole journey of uh, my fellowship and my study couldn't have started because so much of my time from the family is now devoted to OFP. Thank you so much for uh, patient listening. Thank you. Beautifully done, uh, Sonia. Uh, really you, nicely sir. condensed. Um, I know you were stressed out to um, to probably present to your own alma mater, but I think um, you've done a wonderful job, and they should be proud of you, and you should be proud of your uh, where you graduated from. And I'm really happy for both the uh, ends of the, both this, this equation. It's amazing. So beautiful work, and uh, I think I will see you in other other stages as well. That's the possible thing so. looking at here. But uh, thank you. Beautifully done. Thank um, you, sir. And I'm going to continue with a few more slides. Then we will take a few questions, if any. I know there's something being typed up. So we're going to look at that. Um, so let's see what we do. Um, go from here. A couple of more slides, and then I'll be done. Uh, let's go here. Yes, so the question is, um, and this will be expanding much more um, next week. I believe it's next week or two weeks from now um, in um, in my lecture to or presentation to Manipal, which is my alma mater. Uh, and this is what we'll be going over, some pathophysiology of what happens here. If you don't see anything wrong with the tooth, regardless of how many years you've been in practice or how much you know, stop treating on that tooth. And the first thing that will be non-odontogenic origin of a toothache is myofascial, as from the muscle. Most of the blunders are committed uh, in general practice and even, even in um, specialty practice, I would think uh, that is because of the referral pattern from uh, muscle, which is myofascial. The second reason is nerve, neuropathic. We can call up... Uh, pre-trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, traumatic neuroma, which is my research topic, and PTT. And then there's quite another few ones that would probably end up in, in misdiagnosis by dentists, even specialists. Uh, neurovascular is lesser, but we see it. And like I said, we see it quite a few because we are a tertiary uh, thing. Um, if Yenapoy has a, let's say, you incorporate something like this, you will begin to see more because my strong feeling is that you will begin to appreciate um, the diagnosis of neurovascular disorders. The other ones that are um, referred from sinus, uh, cardiac, these used to be in the literature a lot, but that is not what we see mostly. I've seen probably one cardiac referred case, and that's a 911 call, um, or in your where you are, it'd be like a call to the hospital or something. And sinus, yeah, it happens too. But the myofascial is the number one cause, uh, other than tooth itself, pathology, uh, uh, is a funny one. Because before 2005, I used to brand a few patients every, maybe every two months, as psychogenic pain. I can tell you, really, there's no such thing. Um, very, very few, maybe one in like 5,000 cases that I thought of OFP may be psychogenic, maybe. And that too, I think because I am not equipped in my brain, in my abilities to diagnose that case, that's why it looks like psychogenic. 99.99% .99 of what we think are psychogenic before you have the knowledge are not psychogenic. That's because we have, don't have the knowledge to diagnose these cases. And that is why when they get branded as psychogenic cases, it worsens them. And the problem is, the more you brand them, the more they get worse. Now they're really becoming psychogenic. 
And that has happened quite a few times. So there is no such thing really as psychogenic. Very, very, very extremely rare. So that's a, a thing I take um, to give you guys. Um, these are the students. Every every batch, every class of students at Rutgers and Rochester, we have at least uh, a few from India, and they're the they're amongst the brightest as well. So uh, without any doubt, I can say that there is uh, so much brains in India. The brain power is not used, and the courses such as this and webinars such as this, I hope that will bring out those colorful ones and, and really make them glitter. Trigger points, uh, temporalis. This is this is the most common. The most common is a uh, um, masseter. But as you can see, if you don't see anything wrong with these teeth, you need to be educated to identify the trigger point and how to reproduce that pain and how to shut it down by a trigger point injection. We will stop here when you say, you don't see any pathology of that tooth, don't start treating the tooth. Don't start grinding it down. Don't start changing the fillings and, and crowns and worst case root canal and extraction. That, those are the medical malpractice mistakes that have been done. Masseter really robustly, masseter trigger points go. So when you see an MODBLG amalgam, there's no G, but I just made it up. Um, and the patient points out the tooth, that's not a diagnosis because the patient pointed it out. Putting a patient on antibiotic is not a diagnosis. That's the biggest mistakes we do. Okay, the patient pointed out to an uh, upper right molar. I put the patient on antibiotic. Patient feels better. What is the diagnosis? Must be an infection. Wrong, because we know from literature that antibiotics themselves have considerable analgesic properties. So is it the antibiotic property of the antibiotic that worked? or the analgesic property. And the answer in these cases is analgesic property. Antibiotics really don't jump into abscesses, but they do prevent the further expansion. Literature is really clear on the analgesic properties of antibiotics. So let us not make the mistake of diagnosing a tooth problem from its response to an antibiotic. That cannot be done. That procedure or process is called pharmacologic testing. And there's very few drugs such as nitroglycerin for angina, so for angina pectoris, nitroglycerin can be diagnostic, sublingual can be diagnostic, not for a tooth with antibiotic, that is wrong. And the biggest mistakes are in those cases, the culprit was a muscle that we are not trained to. Um, there is the, one of the biggest names in burning mouth syndrome, this is Dr. Miriam Grushka. And I've been very blessed to know these pioneers, thank God for that. Crack tooth syndrome, that's another, uh, um, big thing so the question is did you notice a crack uh, oh yes i noticed a crack where was it there was a vertical line on enamel vertical line on enamel is called craze lines they're not cracked teeth so the question is was there a crack or you cracked the tooth while like luxating it or pulling it out and then you call it a crack tooth the m many cases is the latter not the former really crack tooth so what are you looking at is it a split tooth okay fine is it visible in radiograph fine rarely there are cases that you can see probably on a cbct maybe you might pick up if it's a right cut and yeah th that does happen but if you don't see a cause for it don't start by doing a root canal do the right testing um, biting on a on, on a bite stick and reproducing the pain might not be the best no, no test is all proof. I mean, foolproof because you, you have a case where you look at a craze line and it's coming from the masseter. When you bite onto that bite stick, it will hurt. The tooth will hurt because that's a referral pattern. Now, based on that, you diagnose the tooth as cracked tooth and maybe do a root canal or pull it out. You just to, uh, treated the wrong cause. So I really urge to achieve the knowledge that is necessary to avoid such blunders as this. And new paradigm is, I'm not sure about cracked teeth unless it's split into halves. Let's look at the real literature and maybe it is not cracked teeth. Maybe it is the muscle referral or neuropathic pain. Those are the two big causes for cracked teeth. That's my mentor in research, Dr. Eli Eliab, Dean of Rochester, where I teach also. So I'm going to stop there. This is the talk for beginning of the talk in sleep medicine for the next time. 
we are exactly at 11.55 my time. Um, I, Hari Kishore, if you're there, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I will take some questions before we probably yes, can sir. disperse for the day. And I know there is quite a few here that's uh, popping up. If one of you can maybe read it out rather than me going through the whole thing, that would be OK. Too. Yeah, Dr. Umar, Dr. Umar is going to do that for us, uh, sir. OK. Um, I don't know if I need to stop the sharing the screen, or you are OK? No, no, that's OK, sir. OK. Uh, so there is a question from Dr. Simon. Um, there's a lot of echo, Uma, when you talk. Either come close to the microphone, or I don't know what you need to do. And it's very muffled. Uh, sir, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Uh, how is it? So there is a question uh, from Dr. Simon. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it is it the dentist failure to recognize pain due to lack of training, or is it how much money I can milk from the patient? <laughs> because I yes. see a lot of patient here with full mouth RCT with veneers and Hollywood mm -hmm. smile. I feel you know it's not. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Ma, for that uh, relaying that question. I I cannot agree any 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 more, but couple of things philosophically i believe if you hurt a patient for money there's only one use that money can go to it is spending for his or her own health and the health of his family that's going to go down karma is going to come back there's no question it has to be there they think they won for the uh, you know um, for the lo uh, short term it's probably not going to happen not probably it's not going to happen that's one thing and he's absolutely right there's a lot of um, very, very money hungry people in every field. It's not just dentistry, every field. That's just arrogance and the lust and greed. Um, this, uh, you know, this type of knowledge is not for them. Uh, they should be just not practicing dentistry at all. That's what I, I think should happen. They should not practice dentistry. But because that's criminal um, and we don't, I don't think we have any uh, place for criminals in any field of medicine, including dentistry. But um, the other part is, uh, I believe most of us are very conscientious dentists. Um, like if I take 100 dentists at random, I think 90% of them are really conscientious, want to do the right thing, and of course, go to make, uh, make a good living. But um, there is nothing uh, that, will preclude them from taking a good course and um, reading up the literature. I really urge it, and it can be done. But thank you, Simon, for that question. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Dr. Sharma Lendu Laskar. Uh, mm -hmm. He has asked a referred patient with history of extraction from first molar to canine till now, one after another, because she is having pain on a specific tooth after extraction. She have on the adjacent tooth afterward. What could be the reason? He is saying that there is history of extraction from first molar to canine cell. So yeah. one after the other, it has been extracted because of the pain. So yes. he is asking what could be the reason? The reason could be any of those that I wrote it down um, on that. The, again, this is not uh, a diagnosis class, but um, it is obvious, at least for that clinician to know, that is not dental cause, at least that much, right? And then this is this is the case that will get referred to. So if you have a case like that, I don't know where you live. Um, if you have a case like that, I urge you to find one of my students uh, in the program. They are all over India now. So uh, if you post it to maybe Dr. Uh, Sonia. Uh, she can find out her batchmates or from the mastership and others, and they can, um, they will be more than happy. Because one of the things I tell my students is never preclude a patient, um, not when I am their teacher. So they will see to it that these patients are uh, will be seen at some point. You can discuss the case, and then more than likely bring it, bring it the patient to. Um, and you can work up the case with one of them, refer them specifically. Uh, this one and a half hours or the next 50 hours will not be enough to teach OFP. And the second thing I have is that's the dentist 
uh, what was his name again, Uma? What was the dentist name who, who asked this question? I don't know if Uma, I lost Uma or maybe not. Dr. Okay, so Shama Lindu Laskar, Dr. Shama Laskar. Um, um, oh, I okay. don't know whether that person is still here. Or okay, there. so please ask them to contact maybe um, Sonia through your uh, whoever is on the on the uh, in the university. Please ask them to contact them, and uh, I know that Sonia will be okay to um, work up the case within the limits of where she is in Elaine. Uh, but that would be the best thing to do because that patient is suffering right now. And it's an injustice. Wherever that was done, extraction of teeth one by one. This is the nonsense we need to stop. And it's not just one. Everyone on the screen has this seen this case. Believe me, if you think it's not. Statistics is amongst all the root canals, and those and those listening uh, to me out there, three to eight percent of the root canals either start with non-odontogenic tooth pain or end with no, uh, uh, neuropathic pain. Either start or end. That is quite a few number. And I'm not making this up. This is literature. Three to eight percent. I'll give you the uh, all the citations if you want. As used to be called atypical odontology, all that stuff is gone. Then we said it PTTN. The terminology has changed. The concept has not changed. Three to eight percent. Average, six percent. So if you treat 100 patients in root canals, six of them either started with a non-dental or ended up with a neuropathic pain, nerve pain. This is the truth. So please refer to uh, Sonia and see what Sonia will probably coordinate depending on the geographic location of her classmates. Uh, and then if they are, there are mastership students also, uh, pretty much all over India, please uh, refer to them. Yes, sir. I, I urge you to do it. Let's stop it right yes. there. I feel for yes. the patient and for the dentist who asked this question. Yes, definitely. Uh, okay. Sir, there is one more question from Dr. Rashmi. Uh, sure. She is asking how to differentiate referred pain on mandible due to cardiac issues with a normal toothache or pain on mandible, mandible due to any lesions. Okay. Uh, how so, to uh, yeah. So, uh, two things. Uh, one, the prevalence and incidence of cardiac related toothaches. The thing is, which is more prevalent? myofascially induced okay um around 20 percent of the toothaches 15 to 20 percent belong to non-dental causes under let's say 15 percent tops the rest of the 85 percent is dental causes uh, but remember the rest 10 to 15 that's our realm that is where all just two things forget the headaches and all of the things that uh, sonia so eloquently referred to those are more complex cases, but those two things. Now, cardiac um, to differentiate is not very difficult. The classic question we ask during the board exam is what should you have in your emergency kit if you suspect cardiac? You should have nitroglycerin. You have to put that under the tongue. In cardiac case, it will go away, correct? Or reduce. Of course, activate the hospital, 911 or whatever you have, activate it but you're trying to save a life. If it's a headache that is causing it, what will happen with nitroglycerin? It's a vasodilator. It's going to increase the mighty. So if the pain goes away, you're still happy. You might have saved a life, but you activate 911. You have to immediately get the patient to the hospital. Maybe they need a catheterization or something. But if it's the increase of pain, the toothache, and maybe even the head aching, that's a good thing because that's a migraine 99 percent of the time migraine is a disease of associated with vasodilatation you cost more vasodilatation by using nitroglycerin it will increase the headache not reduce it so that's one trick and the other one is what to do a diagnostic block if the tooth is there and you if you suspect cardiac then stop everything but if you're not sure what's the best thing you can do don't use epinephrine do a right, nice 3% carbocane block, block the tooth. And believe me when people have said, oh my God, there's hot tooth. What is so hot about a tooth? You really, either you're missing the diagnosis or you're the tech operator error, where they're panicking and they're going somewhere else and numbing the rest of it out, 
or you injured the nerve, caused probably bleeding around the nerve, then the local anesthetic will not work. As we know, blood is the best buffer. So there's so many other causes. If you are in doubt, activate the hospital. If you are not in doubt, you think it is, um, but it's confusing, nitroglycerin should be in your armamentarium. And this is a bold question, by the way, the one she asked. I hope I answered her question. Uma? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, there are two more questions from sure. one from Dr. Sajid. He has mm -hmm. asked, can you mention a few component, component points to distinguish atypical odont odontology? Can two you mention a yes. few component points to distinguish atypical odontology? So atypical odontology, which is what we, we say AO, is a very old term now. It's been deleted from our terminology, but old literature will show it. Traditionally, atypical odontology is what? A toothache where there is no tooth problem, okay? You are just a tooth, do you do root canal, you do this, you do that, no change in the pain. You do a block or infiltration of that tooth, the pain, the patient says, ah, that tooth is 50% eh, better. So you're thinking, huh, it's a root canal done tooth. There is pain. I block the tooth. It's 50% better. What's wrong with that picture? You pump in a little bit more anesthetic. Ask the patient, what happened now? I'm numb. Uh, I'm really numb. Uh, no, that's not what I asked. What happened to the toothache? Well, it's like 40% still there. Don't treat that tooth. It's not the tooth then. So don't second guess the anesthesia at that point, especially a maxillary tooth. You can easily infiltrate buckle, easily infiltrate the palatal. You covered all bases. How can it be then the tooth? So don't drill into the tooth further. Don't change the root canal. Believe me, the notion, notion that we have that the MB2 canal is the nerve fiber sitting somewhere hiding from the chlorox or the peroxide or the um, chlorhexidine, all that stuff, saline. Nerves are so viable. They, you expose it to the air, it dies. Meanwhile, we are pumping all these toxins in there, and then we believe foolishly that that MB2 canal that can sit in there and hurt the patient for the rest of our life. Not true. So let's look at the literature and say, are we saying something sane or insane? Right? It's a great question that she asked. It's amazing what she asked. These are the candidates I'm looking for the course that I teach, like Sonia is. Uh, it's just really, they are beginning to get, see, for let's say 100 people attended a seminar of mine somewhere, and 80 of them will be like gunpowder, like dry gunpowder. You just take a little bit flame to them, they'll be like, the whole thing will be burnt out, their brains. And that was Sonia, that was Sonal, and that was the other folks who joined us in here. They were the dry gunpowders. Some of them are a little moist gunpowder, you know? You have to just heat it up a little bit, a little bit. That's like, let's say 10% of the audience, moist ones. Heat up, then light it up, it'll be lit up. There will be 5% that will be like drenched in water gunpowder. There's nothing I can do for them. That's really, really 5%. They will get out of this presentation, go home and drill more teeth with no thought process. You can't help it. It's in medicine. It's in every branch of medicine. It's in science. It's in literature. They publish the same dumb things all over again. That 5%, we're not worried about. 95% of my audience, and especially ones that come into a program like this, almost 100%, will get something out of this. And I'm very happy that they will get something from both what I said and Sonia said. To answer your question, atypical odontology is an old term. We have come, new term was deaffrontation pain. Then the new term was PTTN, post-traumatic trigeminal, uh, persistent post-traumatic trigeminal neuropathy. And then we have come to two more sections. Um, now the latest one, please refer to something called ICOP, I-C-O-P. This will be the standard in dentistry sooner or later. And my dean is the one that is, dean meaning he's in Israel now, uh, Dr. Rafi Benolia, ICOP, International Classification of Orofacial Pain. 2020 just came out, and I was fortunate to sit with the committee, at least one section of the committee, 
to listen in to what they do from all around the world. Amazing people. So please look into ICOP. Uh, so uh, atypical odontology, that term does not exist anymore as of now. I hope I'm, most of those cases are post endo cases that still feel the pain and pre endo cases that end up with the pain. I hope I answered his question. Thank you very much, sir, for this answer because this is what we constantly come across and we will be looking out for the answers. There yes. is a last question, sir. Uh, is there any diagnostic algorithm for differentiating the types of orofacial pain? Is yes, there, there any, is. Uh, uh, and that's called fellowship course. <laughs> I pump in 150 hours into these brains. They're still calling me for cases. I pump in 400 hours of this into my mastership uh, students. They're calling me with the cases. I pump in two years of full masters, and they're calling me with the cases. So it's just the same as uh, oral surgery, prosthodontics. It's a never-ending story, and there is no cookbook. The cookbook is made up in your brain, and it takes perseverance and persistence over a lot of years. I'll tell you that. Sonia is finding it out very the hard way. I was just, I was just well, thinking which was this algorithm that I missed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. So yeah, there is no, I mean, there are guidelines. The guidelines for orofacial pain is a every single book. day. Every single day. I believe like what my favorite textbook, Bhagavadam, says, I believe we are students of life until we die. So that's my motto. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for all the answers for the questions. Now over to Dr. Hari Sure. So uh, there aren't any questions anymore in the chat box, even in the YouTube link, where which is attended by about 110 participants. Uh, we had a limited entry to this sure. uh, Google Meet, fortunately. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sripati Rao, sir, would you like to um, add a few things or comment on? Um, good evening. Yeah, I listened to the whole lecture by Davis and uh, Sonia. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I want to add one experience of mine, just a few minutes. Yes, sir. It's not about the facial yes, pain. I remember in 1982, I got a patient from, uh, actually a patient from USA actually, he was an employee at uh, Kudramu. Yeah. He came with a complaint yes. of uh, numbness in the lower lip, one yes. side of the lower lip. So like any other dentist and a surgeon, I started assessing the whole case, started looking at the possibility of uh, any nerve compression in any way, either by pathology or something, or any traumatic bite on None of these things were available, yes. these data. Yes. And um, we also gave a diagnostic block to see any further uh, paralysis shall occur. There is not much change. But one thing yes. I did is I asked for a blood picture immediately. I had a doubt yes. that it is beyond a dental cause for this numbness. Yes. And I consulted a physician and for my horror, I came to know he had myeloid leukemia and that what? was the first... Yes myeloid leukemia, and that was the first sign. Yes. You know, the first indication of the disease was developing numbness in the lower limb yes. because of the nerve compression there. Yes. By the absolutely. multiplying cells, it was compressing. Yes. So that's why I yes. said, I keep telling this, yes. because, you know, in your lifetime, sometime you might get a case like this, you should yes. not, um, you know, you should always remember that there is a possibility, a rare possibility of a presentation like this. Yes, thank sir. you, David. It was very nice listening to you. No, thank you, sir. The, the yeah. comment I would like to make is I, I have uh, really drilled into these people's brains that numbness is a red flag. And we don't assume anything. Once they say numbness, we actually order every test, including the blood test, CMP with differential, uh, uh, you know, uh, CBP with differential, CMP with electrolytes. We start there and we order an MRI right away. And that MRI would say, our protocol, this is a specific protocol that will track the nerve from its, or, uh, from its terminal branch all the way to the trigeminal root entry zone. That is a must. So amazingly, you had to order that blood test, uh, which now the articles, the literature is very clear. There's something called numb chin syndrome, 
And one of the things is leukemia and more robustly is multiple myeloma. So those are the two things that will come up as a sudden numbness with no reason, no dental treatment, nothing. And as all of us know, those are life-changing events. And one is, like you said, you remember still from 1982, yeah. that's yeah. how much life-changing it is, both for the clinician and for the patient and the family. Very well true. done, sir. I didn't know this. True, true. Oh, uh, I wish I could publish it with you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yes. I'll be there for the next talk. Next month. Yes, yeah. yes. And, yes, thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can we take one more question, sir? One last question. Sure, Harry. Go ahead. Um, role of diagnostic auricular templar blocks uh, to differentiate between MPDS and TMD uh, by Varsha Upadhyay. Okay, so um, as you know, auricular temporal nerve supplies the TMJ in, let's say, 80% of the supply is auricular temporal. The rest is what? Mesoteric and deep temporal. Okay, so 80% auricular temporal, let's say 15% deep mesoteric nerve, and the 5% is deep temporal. Okay, three nerves. It is very difficult once you go through a course like this to confuse between myofascial pain and uh, TMD, I mean TMJ pain, especially auricular temporal pain. I'm going to drill your brain if you're in a course like this, that this doubt probably will never happen in your lifetime. But that requires a specific workup of the case. Myofascially induced pain, we have to reproduce 100%. There is no way we can classify that as myofascial pain. If you are unable to reproduce the pain, and then block the pain by injecting the trigger point. There is no diagnosis. So those are called active trigger points, not latent, active. So much to learn about trigger points. Auricular temporal, like I was telling you, my first block was uh, on my own guru, which I still remember, God bless his soul, Dr. Henry Gramian, and it was amazing. And then uh, one of our faculty at Rutgers, Dr. Samuel Quek, uh, he developed something called twin block, which uh, this batch of students are going to get a full lecture on it. It's coming up in, uh, I think, a month or, so, or two. That's called a twin block, where a technique you can use, twin block, and I'm, a, I'm part of the publication. Please look up Massetric nerve block slash twin block, and my name and Samuel Quek's name will pop up on the um, PubMed. It's, it's PubMed indexed. And if you can read it, uh, but the whole TM joint gets completely numb along with the mesotric and a little bit of the deep temporal. It's a special technique he developed and his, his name is on it. So please look it up. But believe me, once you go through a course like mine, you will not, be, uh, you will not have any confusion. You will not ask me this question. So you have to be trained. That's, the, that's my um, um, morale of the story. Okay. Any other? I think we've come to uh, 1218. I need to get into another lecture by 1245. So um, if there is no other questions, they can probably channel to Sonia and then she can discuss with me. Okay, sir. So yes. that person whom to contact your indoor cell, the person where the teeth went, they went on extracting the teeth, sir, uh, from uh, molar to canine. Yes. Uh, that person can they, is work, uh, indoor, Madhya Pradesh, they, sir. Uh, Madhya Pradesh? Uh, yes, sir. Indoor. They are um, asking anybody I'm, they can contact from your team. Okay. Can you do me a favor? Can you, mm. I mean, this patient is like a, I feel mm. so bad for them. Canine mm -hmm. to the molar, what they're thinking. But mm -hmm. can you just give the contact to um, Sonia so she can yes, post sir. it to definitely, me? Definitely, I'll definitely. post it in my five groups. I'm 100% mm -hmm. positive there's somebody in Madhya Pradesh from my group mm -hmm. somewhere. Yes. So please post it. And I'd be more than happy to help them out. Yes, I'll contact sir? Sonia. But yes, sir. Yeah, if nothing works, then uh, if Sonia goes a little lazy for the next five days, that's fine. <laughs> then you contact me directly and I'll, need, I'll do the needful. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You don't allow us to be lazy in any way. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so either, but yeah, things can happen. I keep you on the toast. Okay. I know. 
uh, I, I don't see any uh, any other question in the chat box. So if there is anyone else who would like to ask, uh, or shall we wind? I think we're good. Yeah. Dr. Right. Davis, uh, it was so wonderful talk. Dr. Davis, it was wonderful. Really. Yeah, Shambhat here. Yes, sir. Super. It was really wonderful. Now, how three people were listening? The Dr. Vidya, my wife is a prosthodontist. My son yes. is oral medicine doing. He's a fan of you. Big yeah. fan of your talk. And Hello. Always praise about your talk. And anytime he was there in the group. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank um, you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for the good words. And hello to your family. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vidya is my teacher, sir. She uh, She's a staff wow. in prosthodontic department. I'm the only stranger here. Well, I'm not a stranger either. I was with you before. No, Davis. I, I you know guys... when I, Davis, when I, when I was in Mangalore, MKMC, you were then Manipur. Yes, I remember your name. And I remember you. I Thank can't you. recollect until I saw the picture. I no recollect. problem. No problem. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shambhat, sir. Uh, any other questions? Uh, or shall we wind up? Yes, we could. Well, um, uh, cherish your teachers and mentors. Yes, sir, uh, we do. And your name uh, just got added to our list. Thank you, Dr. Davis and Dr. Sonia, for gi giving us an insight into the vast ocean of orofacial pain. There's a lot of uh, lot to learn and unlearn. And the need of the R is to, to a, uh, a, uh, R is a change in perception an attitude towards orofacial pain by shifting from traditional textbook concepts to evidence-based uh, practice. Thank you, Dr. B.S. Sripati Rao, sir, Dr. Shambhat, sir, Dr. Akhtar, sir. Thank you, moderators, Dr. Chatra, sir, Joyce, madam, Sanat, sir, delegates both from India and outside India. Thank you once again. And um, we look forward uh, to your uh, next webinar, sir, on 15th October on an another interesting and a multidisciplinary topic obstructive uh, sleep apnea. Till then, uh, stay home, stay safe, and keep learning. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you all. Kindly, uh, yeah, kindly do fill uh, the feedbacks form uh, so that we can post a certificate to, the, to your emails. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank morning. You, good bye, Sonia. Good day. Thanks, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.